some part of our being knows this is where we came from. We long to return. And we can, because the cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. And that is Carl Sagan, of course. We are made of star stuff. We are the way for the cosmos to know itself. I'm very excited to have, as our interview today, Neil Shubin, who agrees with what Carl Sagan says. In fact, he goes a step further and proves it. Neil Shubin is, uh, well, if I read his whole biography, it would take the whole show. So let me just read a little from the flap of his newest book. The newest book is called The Universe Within, Discovering the Common History of Rocks, Planets, and People. He's the author of the best-selling book, Your Inner Fish, which was chosen by the National Academy of Sciences as the best book of the year in 2009. He trained at Columbia, Harvard, and at Berkeley. He is now the Associate Dean of Biological Sciences at the University of Chicago, and in 2011, 2011, elected to the National Academy of Sciences. So welcome to Free Thought Radio, Neil. Yeah, thanks for having me. I have to tell you, your book, the, Your Inner Fish, is one of my all-time favorites. It's one that I'm, keep, I'm keeping it on the shelf up next to Darwin and Dawkins and Pinker and all these great writers. Uh, the, the connection between us and, um, well, and fish. And uh, you, um, I should tell our listeners, you're, you're the real thing. You're, you, you know, I read in your books that you, you're actually out in these remote areas discovering these fossils. Tell us just a little bit about your inner fish and the important fossil discovery that you made, and then we'll move to your new book. Well, so Your Inner Fish was a book about our connection to the rest of life on our planet. And, you know, I was led to that as my, by my work as a paleontologist, where, you know, each summer I go out and look for fossils. And, and one of the problems that's been really interesting to me over my career was the transition from fish to land-living animal, an event that happened over 375 million years ago. And we've been on the hunt for creatures that tell us about that for a long time. And uh, up in the Canadian Arctic, we ran expeditions for about six years and planned an expedition to find a link between these uh, two great forms of life. And, and boom, we found it in 2004, and it was published in 2006, uh, which is a fish called Tiktaalik. And it, uh, like a land-living animal, it has a flat head with eyes on top, uh, has a neck. Uh, but like a fish, it has scales in its back and, and fins with fin webbing. But inside its, its fins have you know bones that correspond to our our upper arm, forearm, even parts of our wrist. You know, so here's a transitional creature. Now, what spawned the book, Your Inner Fish, was, you know, the realization uh, that I wanted to tell to a much larger audience rather than just my scientific colleagues is the idea that this event, this wonderful event in the history of life, is not just some esoteric, you know, dead end, you know, the transition from fish to land-living animal. It's a piece of biological and earth history that's inside our own bodies. You know, so that every time you bend your wrist or shake your head, you can thank the neck or the wrist that arose in Tiktaalik and its evolutionary cousins. Your inner fish. Yeah, I, I remember that was. That. I remember that was big news, at least in the science world, when that discovery came forth. So you're the guy that that found it. You, what you? you I, I know from reading your book, you spent months out in these remote areas. You, you were just looking on the ground, looking for fossils, and you you spotted this. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm privileged to be working with, you know, a bunch, a team of people who are incredibly talented. You know, you don't find fossils alone. Uh, and uh, I work, you know, my team and I uh, have been working up in the Arctic uh, since 1999. Uh, you know, looking at Devonian age rocks. Well, so we went up there for a reason. We went up there because it had rocks of the right age to answer the question, rocks of the right type to hold the fossils. And more importantly, because it was up in the Canadian Arctic, it was those rocks were likely to be exposed at the surface. We can actually look at them and see the bones weathering out. And that's exactly what happened. Um, it took us a number of years to be successful. We really didn't do well for the first few years. Uh, but then uh, in 2004, we uncovered a layer of rock that had skeleton after skeleton of fish fossils piled one on top of the other. And one of those fish was uh, the snout of this creature, uh, Tiktaalik. And I, I got to tell you, you know, being a scientist and being in the field and making a discovery where you see something for the first time mm -hmm. that nobody else on the planet has seen, it's a truly special experience. And it's made more special when that fossil tells you something new about the world or about our bodies. And, and that was why I had so much fun writing Your Inner Fish was because I had a chance to tell that story, uh, as well as a lot of other stories related to our you know, 
connections to the rest of life on the planet. We had um, Donald Johansson on our show a couple years ago, and he says the same thing when he was in Ethiopia, and he spotted that Lucy bone. I, I forget the exact bone, but when he saw it... It was an elbow. It was an elbow. Yeah, and I, maybe not you, but I would just see a bunch of junk and rocks and litter, on it, and he was able to walk there and say, look at that. He could spot that thing. And I got to see the actual Lucy when it was in New York City at the Discovery. Um, and, and, of course, Donald says, I can point to the exact bone I know where it was found. So what an, am- <laughs> what an amazing feeling it yeah. must be to be able to make that kind of a, of a Yeah, concept. you bet. And, it, you know, you train your eye. It's not like uh, it happens overnight. You, you, you know, like Don, we worked for a number of years in the field, not finding stuff, but we were seeing some fossils, but enough to train our eye to see them. Uh, and then you train your eye in a deeper way. You train your eye to see evolutionary connections. And, and when you do that, you know, it changes the way you see the world. You yeah. know, when you know evolutionary history, it changes the way you see human bodies. When you know the history of the planet and the solar system and the universe, it changes even more fundamentally, you know, how you see our connections, you know, to the rest of the world, you know, let alone the cosmos. Now, I know that uh, in in scientific circles, the phrase missing link is really kind of a, the wrong phrase. But would you call TikTok? Something like that? Well, it's certainly a link. You know, it's a found link. (laughs) And we have many found links. And with, uh, you know, the joke, though, is, you know, we're scientists. So with every new uh, missing link we find, we create two gaps in the fossil record. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, you know, there's always new stuff to find. It's not like you find a link and, you know, the the search is over. Uh, There's always new questions to ask. And one thing I love about science, whether it's paleontology or astronomy or geology, is, you know, we not only find answers, but we find ever powerful new questions to ask, you know, so we're always asking questions. And I like to think that as we discover new things and answer old questions, we discover ever powerful new questions, you know, that's the, I think that's one of the joys of science. So you mean those young earth creationists are wrong when they think that all species were Created independently as separate, what's, what does the Bible call them? Separate kinds, I guess. Yeah, I'm afraid that uh, <laughs> there's not a whole lot of evidence to support that, and we live in the world of evidence, so that's what yeah. it's about. Yeah, there you go. So um, I was impressed looking at your new book. Now, your new book is called The Universe Within, Discovering the Common History of Rocks, Planets, and People. Uh, I'm, I have to confess I'm about two-thirds into it, so I haven't got to the to the final punchline. But, you know, when Dawkins wrote his book, The Ancestor's Tale, it, he showed how uh, the, the history of our biology is written within the DNA. But you're taking it broader. You're, you're showing that the whole history of the universe is stored within our bodies. What, what do you mean by that? You bet. I, but what I did is I started with Stardust, the, the wonderful quote that Carl Sagan opened this segment of your show with, and show how that's only the beginning. That is, inside of us is history and history and history piled on top of one another. That is, we contain in our bodies artifacts of over three and a half billion years of the history of life, over four and a half billion years of the history of the planet and the solar system, and over 13 billion years of the history of the cosmos and the universe itself. So when you see history in bodies, you see layer after layer inside of us. You know, our atoms are derived from the Big Bang and the workings of, you know, fusion reactions inside stars. Um, the molecules in our body and many of our organs and the way they work are because of the, our relationship to the inner workings of the solar system and the planets and the, work, uh, the biosphere itself. So what we have inside of us are connections that exist, not only to other living creatures, but to the workings of the planet, the solar system, and the universe beyond. And, and so the book really follows a timeline, kind of like, much like Richard Dawkins did in his Ancestors' Tale. Only in this case, I'm, finding, I'm following a timeline of the history of the solar system and the you know, cosmos and, and pegging uh, aspects of our anatomy uh, to those relationships and their so, origin. So it's not just organisms that are evolving. You would say the entire universe is evolving. You bet. And so what happens is, you know, our evolution is very much dependent on the environment that we live in, right? So, you know, we would have looked very different if the environment had took a different course. So, so what you'll see is when you, um, uh, if you look at the history of, uh, of our bodies, what you'll see is there are connections to the planet and even the solar system inside of us. Some of them we take for granted in our daily lives. I mean, think about it this way. You know, if you look inside our bodies, we have two trillion cells. Um, each of those two trillion cells um, has the, a working of DNA and proteins that functions as a kind of clock that is the, you know, the, um, the, the, 
the level of DNA and proteins and activity varies in a 24-hour cycle during the day. Indeed, much of our health depends on those clocks. So it's not crazy to say that inside each of us lie over two trillion clocks. If you want to learn more, there's two websites you can go to. One of them is neilshubin.com. And uh, if you want to know more about Tiktaalik, this transitional, I guess, fish, mammal, fossil, whatever you call it, uh, go to Tiktaalik, T-I-K-T-A-A-L-I-K dot uchicago dot E-D-U. So, Neil, um, I was intrigued in your book. You mentioned that the, the, the very shapes of our bodies are determined by things way outside the Earth. For example, how does Jupiter affect the, the shape of the current human body? Well, you think about Jupiter is the largest body in the solar system. And the Earth's orbit, indeed the shape of the Earth and the formation of the Earth, was related to the formation of Jupiter. It's sort of inescapable. As this massive body in the solar system, Jupiter exerts an effect on the Earth's orbit. And in the early days of the solar system, affected um, the Earth's formation itself. It's widely sort of thought that Jupiter formed before our planet. Uh, there's a number of computational models that suggest that, and there's some evidence from meteorites as well that do. And indeed, if Jupiter had not formed in its particular position, we would not have had a habitable planet. That is, the Earth probably would not have formed at the right distance from the sun to support life. Yet also Jupiter affected the size of the Earth as well. If Jupiter formed uh, at a further distance from the Earth, the interior of the solar system would have con consisted of uh, a, a more but smaller rocky bodies. So the Earth would have been smaller uh, or less massive. A less massive Earth would have meant that life would have had to deal with a, a, a lesser pull of gravity, if you will, and that gravity really is sort of the shaper of, of bodies on Earth. So with a lesser pull of gravity, I mean, we would probably have longer, leaner bodies. The opposite would have been true if, if Jupiter formed closer to the sun. The Earth uh, would likely have been, if all else being equal, been more massive. With a greater pull of gra gravity, it would have led to the development of shorter, squatter bodies. The impact of Jupiter actually is really profound. That is one of the most profound effects Jupiter has uh, is actually on human evolution itself. And that sounds bizarre, hmm. but follow me. <laughs> the, um, as we've known for a few decades, the ice ages, that is the waxing and waning of ice from the high latitudes to low latitudes, which happen over history, you know, every few you know, tens of thousands of years, you see these, you know, glacial periods, and then interglacial periods. These interglacial, these glacial and interglacial periods have affected so much of evolution. Um, it's hard to understand evolution in particular parts of the world without understanding the glaciers. And, and part of that is human history and human evolution as well. Turns out that the glacial periods are themselves related in large part to variation in the Earth's orbit that happen over regular cycles. I mean, in a regular cycles, the Earth's orbit varies from some more circular to elliptical, or the wobble and the tilt varies, and these happen every you know, 100,000 and 40,000 and 20,000 years, these cycles of orbital variation. So these cycles of orbital variation we know are one of the main factors that, that cause the waxing and waning of the ice. But it turns out that those orbital cycles are driven by our planet's orbital um, and gravitational uh, interaction with the planet Jupiter, because Jupiter being the, you know, the 12-ton gorilla in the solar system exerts a gravitational pull on Earth, hmm. which warps our orbit, war orbit at certain regular periods. So when you follow the data and you follow the chain of logic that's generated from those data, what you see is that parts of human history and human evolution are influenced by the waxing and waning of the ice. The waxing and waning of the ice is related to, in part, uh, in large part, to changes in the Earth's orbit that happen over regular cycles in history. And those orbital cycles are related to our planet's interaction, gravitational interaction, uh, with Jupiter. Well, so the, <laughs> well, it's kind well, of amazing when you put all those things together. Makes me want to say, by Jove. Exactly. I, I mean, guess I, there's, a, <laughs> there's a phrase for an atheist to say, look up at the heaven. Well, Galileo, <laughs> Galileo trained his telescope on... Uh, they, they used to try to determine uh, longitude by Jupiter's moons, didn't they? So boy. Exactly. Well, when you think about what we've done as a species, you know, we have, you know, mankind, humankind, I should say, has, has really considered, you know, really searched for its place in the universe. You know, what science has taught us is that we're not at the center of things. You know, our planet is not at the center of the universe, let alone the solar system. We circle the sun, as Copernicus showed. Darwin and the biologists had their say, too. You know, our species isn't the center of creation. Our species is 
part of a tree of life that contains billions of other species. So neither our species nor our planet are the center of things. But see, as science, you know, whether it's biology or cosmology, has removed us from the center of the, of the creation and the cosmos, um, it, I think it has given us something else. What it has revealed is that we're deeply connected to the rest of the cosmos. Exactly. We're deeply connected through evolution to other species. We're deeply connected through our evolutionary past and our material past uh, to the planet, uh, the solar system, and the cosmos beyond. So this web of connections includes us. We're not separate from it. We're part of it right down to our DNA. So not only is a cat one of my distant cousins, but so is a... a, a... A rock, I guess. Uh, so it's a rock in a real sense. Uh, I mean, we have a material... So we share... A, the reason why we have that is because we share a history with those entities. Our, you know, our atomic history, if, it, if you will, is shared with the stars. Our molecular history is shared with planets and rocks. Um, and our biological history, our organic history, is shared with other creatures on the planet. So again, when you learn to see history, as I've done as a paleontologist, and as other people do as, you know, the DNA, you know, molecular biologists and so forth, what you start to see is layer after layer of history in the human body. And with those layers of history, you start to see layer after layer of deep interconnections among us and kind of everything else, you know. And that was the beautiful story I wanted to tell in, yeah. in both books. Oh, you do, it, you do it yeah. so well, and there's so many... I wish I had time to read some of the eloquent paragraphs in there about our interconnectedness. You know, a paleontologist studies rocks in... The moon is a rock, and the, the moon also has affected life on this planet. Oh, my gosh, yeah. I mean, so it's hard to imagine life without the moon's interaction. Well, one of the main things, there are two main things when you think about the moon, is certainly the tides and the tidal evolution of the Earth, which I never really talked about in the book, but it's a big, big story. It's actually one of the chapters I you know, removed because I wanted to keep the book a certain length. The, um, uh, but the other is you know, the, the length of the day. The length of a day, the light dark cycles, is based on the spinning of the Earth, uh, the rotation of the Earth, I should say, and, the, um, and it's our interaction with the moon. And, and so the clocks that are inside our bodies are tuned to this Earth moon cycle. Indeed, other creatures have tidal clocks that are tuned to the monthly tidal cycles. So when we see our dependence on the Earth moon system, we see it not only to the tides, but to, to, but to day night cycles that defines so much of our own biology and indeed even the working of our DNA. Doesn't the word menstruation come from the word moon? It comes from moon. And interestingly, that's one of those examples that's probably not related to the moon. Uh. So people haven't really been related to it. Uh. Um, originally, they thought so, but no one's been able to find a mechanistic link. And the critical thing, obviously, for you know, a scientist is to find a, you know, a mechanistic okay. link. Is there, is there a consensus that the moon actually did break off from the Earth from an impact? Yeah, there is a consensus. Now, there are a couple different theories out there. So there's, no, um, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's one favored theory at the moment, but there are others out there that may rise. And so uh, we'll see where the data sorts out over the next, uh, over the next five to ten years. But one, the, main, the, the, the consensus theory uh, is that a uh, large asteroid, a Mars-sized asteroid, actually hit the Earth during its early stages of formation. And material from that asteroid and the Earth spalled off as dust which swirled the forming Earth and then later congealed as the moon through gravitational attraction. And that also explains the tilt, wouldn't it? Yeah, it explains the tilt of the Earth. So seasonality uh, may be related to that impact. Um, the actual distance of the, uh, of the moon relative to the Earth, the um, atomic composition of the rocks of the moon are explained by that. Um, so there are a lot of facts, both in moon rocks as well as in the properties of the Earth's orbit and the moon's orbit that are explained by that theory. Um, so, you know, but we'll see how it all sorts out, because we're learning more with each passing day. Well, we're out of time here, Neil. Uh, we're talking with Neil Shubin, the scientist, uh, author, uh, biologist, author of The Universe Within, Discovering the Common History of Rocks, Planets, and People. We didn't have time to talk about the eye, the human eye. That's a fascinating chapter in your book. Thank you so much for being on Free Thought Radio, Neil. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.